In today's video, I'll be offering my thoughts and review of the brand new Fujifilm XF 33mm f1.4 after a month of use. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is Dylan Goldby and welcome back to another Gear Short. Now, this week's video is going to be about the brand new XF 33mm f1.4 from Fujifilm. Uh, we got these about a month ago in Korea and I was on the waiting list so I got one of the first ones and I've had it for about a month now. So I feel like I'm ready to start maybe talking a little bit about how it's been to use and how it compares to the XF 35mm f1.4. Now, we are going to do quite a few uh, comparisons with the XF 35mm, not because they're the same lens or that one replaced as the other, but because I think a lot of people are going to be deciding between one of the two uh, to fill a certain role in their photography. So I'll definitely uh, make comparisons where they're needed between these two lenses. So with this lens, we're dealing with the quote unquote normal lens. So it renders uh, distance in your photos very much the way that your eye might see it. So you're not going to see a lot of perspective distortion either way. You're not going to see the, the lengthening of things that you might see with a wide angle lens or that sort of perceived compression that you might see with uh, with a telephoto lens. So very much what, we're, uh, what our eyes are used to seeing and so a comfortable focal length for a lot of different uses. Now for me basically I'm using it for my family sessions, my couple sessions, uh, my corporate events and then also I'm going to use it a lot as a walk around lens. Before we jump in and talk about the lens though I did want to mention that on November 13th I will actually be presenting my work in a conversation with the Royal Photographic Society uh, India chapter and so we'll be talking a lot about my uh, Tattoos of Asia project and my documentary work and things like that and the topic will will be very much sort of what it is that I do, why I do it, and how I go about finding my subjects. So if you're interested in things like that, I will put the, uh, the link below and you can go ahead and sign up for that. It is free and we will be doing it on Zoom because of the, uh, the current situation. So a little bit different from what we're talking about today, but if you're interested in something like that, please do sign up. I'd love to see you there. All right, so first things first, before we get into actually using the lens, uh, let's just take a look at it sort of physically. So it is a whole new design, and the first thing you're going to notice is that it is a little bit bigger than the 35mm f1.4, and that is to accommodate this uh, internal focusing system, the new focusing motors, and quite a bit more glass. So it is a little bit bigger, it is a little bit heavier, but for my uses I haven't really noticed that to be much different. It's not really a problem. It sort of feels a little bit like a smaller, lighter uh, XF 56mm f1.2. So in terms of fitting it into my bag, I had to move around a couple of dividers just so that I could accommodate a slightly larger lens, but small price to pay for having a really, really good quality lens in your bag. Being a slightly larger, heavier lens, I do think it's better suited to bodies like the X-T4, the X-Pro3, rather than smaller, lighter bodies like the X-E4. So, for me, uh, I don't really worry about these things, but I know a lot of people talk about bodies getting very front heavy, and I feel like on the smaller, lighter bodies, this is, despite not being a big heavy lens, going to be enough to sort of tip it over. And you might want to look at something like the 35mm f1.4 or the 35mm f2 if that's something that bothers you. One thing that has come with the sort of more modern redesign of the, uh, the optical system in this lens is actually a sort of a more modern looking body. Now this feels a lot more like the design of say the 90mm f2 or the new 50mm f1 rather than the sort of original lenses from Fujifilm like this little guy. The one thing that did bother me about this whole redesign though is that Fujifilm still hasn't updated these little clips, these little plastic clips in their hoods. And so I've found with every single lens that I own own that I've had to replace the hood at some point or another because these just break when you click them in. So hopefully I'm wrong and this one is made of a slightly sturdier plastic but the clips look exactly the same as all the other lenses that I own and it's always been an issue for me. Again, comparing this lens to the 35mm f1.4, one of the things that I and I think a lot of people had uh, trouble with with the uh, f1.4 version is actually trying to clean this front element. If you don't use a filter on the front of this and you actually have to try and uh, clean the front element, it is a, a convex piece of glass and so it sort of dips down into the corners there and it can be very hard to clean the edges of the lens. This guy, on the other hand, uses pretty much the same size element, but it's actually a concave element, so it's a little bit easier to clean. Now, before my filter arrived, I did have to clean it a couple of times, and it was very, very easy to clean, so that's a, a good update. 
the other thing with that design, of course, is that the 35 millimeter had this sort of uh, telescoping external focus design, so this piece would move back and forward. And if you happen to be blocking that as you turned the camera on, there was a chance you could uh, damage or break the motors in there. And so this guy actually uses a fully internal design. So there's no more telescoping with the, the lens when you turn it on. Of course, the uh, the internal elements do move, but you will not see the end extend on this lens. So that's a welcome design change. Before we get into the interesting stuff, let's talk a little bit about the technical optical qualities of this lens. Now, one of the things that a lot of people complained about with the XF 35mm was that it wasn't really the sharpest and most contrasty lens uh, wide open. So you would get this sort of almost a, a softening of details and colors would sort of blend into each other a little bit. And, you know, in compared to, the, say, the 35mm F2, which was sharp and contrasty and punchy, this gave a little bit more of an old school feeling to the, to the rendering. And so a lot of people wanted a, a sharper, uh, more contrasty lens. And the 33mm is definitely going in that direction. It's a much sharper lens. So let's start from just looking at the center here. As you can see in this first image at f1.4, you get a lot more detail from the 33 millimeter. Now, if we switch out the right-hand side image to the 35 millimeter at f2, you'll actually see that they're pretty close in sharpness in the center at this point. So you're getting basically the f2 or f2.8 sharpness that you got from the 35 millimeter at f1.4 in the 33 millimeter. So a big improvement there. The one area that we do see a big performance increase in is actually corner sharpness. Now, with this lens, I don't typically put anything that I want to have a lot of detail in in the far corners of my of my images. But if you're doing something like a lay flat or some advertising or something like that, where you really need corner to corner sharpness, uh, the 33 millimeter is going to be a big improvement over the 35 millimeter. So as we can see in the corners here, the 33 millimeter renders quite a bit of detail wide open. And once you stop down to f2.8 or f4, you're getting pretty close to the amount of detail that you get in the center. Whereas the 35 millimeter is absolutely awful in the corners if you're considering sharpness when it's wide open. And by f2.8 or f4, it starts to become a little bit sort of usable, but still not great. The next thing I want to talk about is chromatic aberrations. So let's first talk about the color fringing that you might see around high contrast edges. Now, it's definitely there in the 33 millimeter, but it's a lot less prominent than with the 35 millimeter. So if we zoom in and take a look at these tree branches here, what you'll see is that we still get a little bit of that green fringing around the edges there in both lenses. But if we stop down to F2 on the 33 millimeter, you'll actually see that it starts to go away very quickly. Whereas with the 35 millimeter, we still get quite a bit of that uh, fringing. Now, of course, you can deal with that in post-production, so it's not always a big issue. But if you're looking to get the most perfect image straight out of camera, then the 33 millimeter is definitely a little bit better than the 35. Now, this is not something that generally bothers me, but there is always at least one person who asks about coma whenever you see a lens review. So the 33 millimeter does exhibit a little bit of coma wide open and you can sort of see it in the corner of this frame here nowhere near as much as the 35 millimeter did so it's definitely going to be a little bit better uh, in that regard for say astrophotography or if you're shooting uh, you know street lights little pin lights um, wide open at night and once you stop down to f2 with the 33 millimeter it's pretty much gone so you've got a fairly good lens a fairly good amount of correction for coma in there the final thing I want to very quickly mention here is the vignette. Now, wide open, you're going to get about a two-thirds stop darkening in the far corners. Um, by f2, it becomes about a third of a stop. By f2.8, it's practically unmeasurable. And by f4, it's completely gone. So I'll talk a little bit more about the vignette in the uh, optical characteristics section. But for now, that's roughly the vignette that you'll get wide open. Now that we're done with all the boring stuff, let's jump in and talk a little bit about the optical characteristics. Now, when it came to the 35 millimeter f1.4, uh, there was this idea that was floating around that there was some sort of magic built into this lens and that everything you pointed it at just looked wonderful. Uh, some people liked that, some people didn't like that idea, and it started quite a few uh, flame wars online. Now, we're not going to address whether or not it has some sort of magic inside, but I am going to discuss it from the perspective of sort of how these two lenses differ. Now, a lot of that magic from this lens came from, I guess, its imperfections. So you're looking at things like, you know, uncorrected chromatic aberrations and the slight softness and things like that. Gave it a bit more of an old-timey uh, feeling that you might get from, say, an old lens 
lens from the film era rather than something that you might see in say a Zeiss Otis or one of the new Sigma lenses that are extremely well corrected and produce these sort of technically perfect images. This lens was a bit of a deviation from that and I think this is what sort of divided people. People either loved that idea or hated that idea. Some people wanted some technically good images, some wanted this sort of slightly off but beautiful image and it could produce those things in certain situations. However, this lens takes a step in the direction of the more modern designs like your Zeissotis or your Sigma lenses and things like that and gives a little bit more sharpness, a little bit more correction, but does it still maintain that feeling was the question that a lot of people had and the question that I had when I bought it as well. In today's video I'm not going to give you the answer to that question but I am going to put quite a few images on the screen so that hopefully you can see the differences for yourself and decide if it's enough to warrant maybe upgrading to this lens or to make you choose between one or the other. Using this first photo, which is a portrait of my wife that I took on a foggy sunrise uh, on a recent trip that we took together, I want to talk a little bit about the bokeh from the 33mm and how it differs from that of the 35mm. Now, I took this uh, photo from the same spot, so I didn't move back to accommodate the slightly tighter field of view from the 35mm, so it's not a perfect comparison, but I wanted to keep it at that same distance to see how things would render. So, the first thing that I noticed with the bokeh from the 33mm is that it is a little bit softer than the bokeh from the 35mm. If we look really closely at the areas around the, the twigs and the leaves and everything, I feel like the 35mm has a little bit more of a, a jittery, a little bit more of a nervous feeling to it, whereas the 33mm has this very soft, almost sort of uh, painted feeling to it. In the second image, we're gonna be looking at some bokeh balls from a street shot that I took a couple of weeks back. Now, if you look very closely at these, again, you'll notice that the 33 millimeter produces slightly rounder balls, slightly smoother balls. And if we look very, very closely, you can actually see that the 35 millimeter uh, displays quite a bit more chromatic aberration around the sides of those balls. Again, which one of these you prefer is gonna be down to your personal taste and the type of images that you like to shoot. So please let me know in the comments which one you prefer and if there's anything you feel like I might've missed uh, when I looked at the bokeh there. One thing that the 33mm can do that the 35mm simply cannot do is producing these beautiful sun stars. So if you're shooting something like a cityscape at night or the sun poking around a tree or a building or something like that and you want to get those beautiful long sun stars, it's simply not going to happen with the 35mm but the 33mm produces absolutely gorgeous sun stars. So let's take a look at a sample here. Now this first image was shot at f1.4 so you can see that that deep vignette is sort of bringing the edges of the the image in there and you can also see that the sun even being right at the edge of the frame is not causing any nasty flare or any uh, loss of contrast or anything like that. Now in this second image I've stopped down to f16 and slightly changed the composition so I could get a full sun star in there but you can see that we get these beautiful long uh, lines coming out from that central point so if that's something that you're into the 33 millimeter is definitely a great lens for that. When it comes to vignettes, this is something that I personally don't correct for very often. I actually quite like the, the natural pull that you get towards the center of the frame from having a vignette. Now, it's not a very deep vignette on this lens, but it's just enough that, say, in you know a portrait or a family a shot or something like that, that you're going to get this beautiful sort of uh, focus being pulled towards the center. And as I mentioned before, it's pretty much gone by f2.8 anyway, and you can correct it in software if you don't like it. The final thing that I've noticed when I've been out shooting with the 33mm is that when you shoot wide open into bright light sources like the sun, I have seen these sort of red flares pop up occasionally. Now, you might have seen, uh, if you've watched my Lauer 33mm 0.95 review, that I absolutely loved the, uh, the rings that you get when you shoot straight into the sun with that lens. And the 33mm produces little pieces of those, and I've, I've been trying to figure out how it is that it creates them, how I can create them using this lens, and if I can make them even bigger. So I'll keep working on that, and if I, I figure out a way to do it, I will uh, create a little video on how to do that. But looking for it. Hopefully we can make it happen as I really love that kind of effect. So 
So on to what it's actually like to work with the 33 millimeter as opposed to the 35 millimeter. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I do work with it in a lot of my uh, couple and family sessions. Now, unfortunately, I won't be able to uh, show you a lot of these images today because a lot of my clients still haven't seen their images and I would like them to be the first people to see them rather than the people of YouTube. So I'm sorry about that, but you'll have to take my word for it as to uh, what it's like to actually work with it. So at these sessions, what I've found is that the autofocus is absolutely lightning fast compared to the uh, 35 millimeter. Now, the 35 millimeter never really gave me too many problems when I was in sort of slow moving situations, you know, even a family walking down, I could get pretty much every frame in focus. And when it came to, you know, static portraits and things, even at f1.4, it just never missed. However, with the 33 millimeter, once you've dialed in the autofocus settings, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, you can actually just be pretty much guaranteed that even with fast moving subjects, you're just not going to miss. Now, when it comes to actually dialing in those autofocus settings, this is something that I want to talk about a little bit, and hopefully we can see updates to in, uh, in firmware coming in the future. Fujifilm's autofocus system is, let's say, complex. There's a lot of little settings that you have to do, uh, you have to put in for different situations uh, to make the camera focus on different types of moving subjects and things like that. And I feel like at this point, Fujifilm is sort of expecting us as photographers to have a degree in their autofocus alg algorithm in order to be able to get everything in focus that we want to. And I hope that that can be a lot more simplified in the future and we can have sort of a unified AFC that will just work. However, when it comes to the XF uh, 35 millimeter f1.4, I found that the general setting in the AFC worked pretty well, and I was able to get you know a lot of images, 90, 95% in focus when we were doing you know walking along and things like that. That dropped a little bit significantly if we were doing something like running or something like that, a little bit faster moving, but it was generally pretty good. What I found with the 33 millimeter is that was not the case. I came home from my first session with it uh, and I sort of thought, okay, well, this is you know getting a lot more out of focus than I was expecting. However, I moved it over to, I believe one of the settings is rapidly uh, changing, rapidly accelerating and decelerating, and the other one is suddenly appearing. And with those two settings, I got a lot higher hit rate when it came to things like uh, kids, because they're quite unpredictable in their movement. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, um, but once you, dial, once you dial those things in, it just doesn't miss, and I don't have to check anymore to make sure I got you know the perfect expression in perfect focus. I can just sort of trust it now, which is a really big thing at my family sessions, to literally uh, not have to be walking between locations quickly checking the photos to make sure everything is in focus when it comes to fast moving stuff. So all in all, autofocus is extremely impressive. Uh, there's no more hunting like we would see with the older lenses like the 35 millimeter. In AFS, it is simply Zip, and it's there. And so, for example, a couple of weeks back, I did school portraits for one of our local schools, and I shot, I think it was 296 people in two days. And over the course of those full two days, I found six images that were out of focus, and four of those were due to kids squirming around and not being able to focus as they moved so quickly. And the other two were either lens or user error. So that's a pretty good track record for having made 290 something portraits, I think. And I was extremely impressed. In terms of AFC, it has become a lot more faster and a lot more accurate once you're able to dial in those settings for the way that you're shooting and the types of subjects that you're shooting. To demonstrate that autofocus, let's take a quick look at a couple of videos that I shot. The other thing that I wanted to test against the 35 millimeter was actually focusing at really far distances, so close to infinity and things like that. With the 35 millimeter, I found it was a little bit touch and go. Uh, if you were focusing on, say, you know, a cityscape a long ways away or a portrait that was 
you know, you were 10, 15 meters from the subject or something like that. I often found that you'd have to stop down uh, the 35 millimeter just to ensure you had enough depth of field to cover its slightly missing focus. With the 33 millimeter, I have found that that is not an issue at all. So to demonstrate this, I'll show you the same image that I showed for the uh, coma demonstration earlier, and we'll take a look at the actual bridge itself. Now, I focused and refocused uh, several times, made different images again and again and again, and in each case, I found found that the 33 millimeter nailed perfect focus and the 35 millimeter, this was the closest that it got. So at far distances, the 33 millimeter focuses a lot more accurately than the 35. Okay, so I've spent the last 15 or 20 minutes or so chatting about the 33 millimeter and the improvements that have been made and how it compares to the 35 millimeter. So in the end, as a self-professed fanboy of the 35 millimeter and somebody who has in the past said that the sharpness isn't really an issue, it's quite good, it's good enough. The autofocus really isn't an issue, it's good enough. And that I really love the rendering of it. Which lens is going to occupy a space in my bag going forward? I'll be honest here and say it's actually going to be the 33 millimeter. This lens has improved on all of those things without really sacrificing, in my opinion, uh, the quality of the images that comes out of it. They haven't become too technically perfect. They haven't become too sharp. There's still a little bit of a softness there. There's some beautiful uh, soft transitions in the colors and everything there. For me, this is the better lens for the work that I do uh, for my family sessions. It's going to mean more photos in focus when we're doing fast moving stuff. For my couple sessions, it's going to mean greater detail. Uh, for my corporate events, it's going to mean better focusing in low light. For all of those things, this is the lens for me. As always, I hope that you've enjoyed this video. And if you do have any questions about the 33 millimeter or how it compares to the 35 millimeter, please do leave them in the comments below. Now, I don't actually have access to the 35 millimeter F2, so I won't be able to sort of accurately answer any questions when it comes to comparing those. But as for these two lenses, I'll do my best to help out if I can. Of course, as with all of my videos, I do have a slideshow of photos shot with the 33 millimeter at the end of this video, so please stick around for that. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and if you haven't already, please do like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.